got to get the knowledge and the facts and then we got to get into action just like Patrick is saying we got to get all fired up we're not going to take it anymore all right now uh, we're going to have Todd and Alicia back up here in a minute and then Judy Berry's going to talk uh, let me tell a couple stories about Judy I've known her for about four or five years since I was in Earth First and I'll just give you one Judy Berry story that uh, uh, the week before Redwood Summer, uh, they had a Redwood Week. And it consisted of putting three women up in three Redwood trees overlooking a, a clear cut on Georgia Pacific land. And I had just gotten my new truck and it didn't have any bumper stickers on it yet. 
and, <coughs> and uh, my previous truck was all covered with bumper stickers and I drove it down to El Salvador and before I got to El Salvador I had to take all the bumper stickers off and it took it about two hours. But anyway, I got this new truck and they said, well, you'd be just the car to take these women up there in the cover of darkness so they could get up in the tree without being seen. So I did that. And then I, I uh, uh, came back the next morning and they were up in the tree sit and the George Pacific people came in and said, uh, you people are trespassing, aren't you? And I said, ah, we know that. In fact, there's three people up in the tree and they're trespassing too. <laughs> <laughs> and the... Uh, but anyway, uh, the George Pacific uh, head timber worker, or the one who was managing the forest, he says, I said, this looks awful, that clear cut over there. He says, this is a good one. And I said, what's a bad one look like if this is a good one? And he, he says, we come in and we cut everything down. And then we waited until the fall, and then we came with the blow torches. And whatever was left, we burned everything down to the ground, everything. And then in the spring, of course they didn't talk about what happened during the winter time on these steep hillsides, but then in the spring when the new sprouts came up from underneath, he says, then we spray it with herbicides. We don't want anything out there except those trees that we're going to plant. Well, that's the kind of thing we're up against. But then in the middle of the week, uh, Daryl Cherney and, and Judy said there was going to be a little action over at Whitethorn. And it might be a little bit rough. And I said, oh, I can't. I like that. <laughs> so I went over to uh, Whitethorn and it was a, a family tree operation doing some pretty ugly cutting of, of uh, second or third cuttings. They were going to cut everything down again. And um, this was a small family, the Lancasters, and I was taking pictures of a little confrontation between the, uh, uh, the Earth Firsters with all their signs and, and uh, their they were playing their instruments and singing, and but these timber workers were very unhappy with this. And I was taking pictures of it. Anyway, Mrs. Lancaster grabbed my camera, and Judy put down her violin and went after my camera. <laughs> and but then one of the other uh, sons came along and says, "No one touches my mother." And he takes his fist about the size of a ham, and he lands right in the middle of uh, uh, Nem's. Oh, there was a woman by the name of Nem, right smack in the middle of her face. And then was a little bit of a Donnybrook. Uh, fortunately, there were more Earth Firsters than the, the loggers, and the loggers ended up at the bottom of the pile. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the uh, sons of the uh, family went back to his pickup truck and got the rifle. And fortunately, he was the one that was sober, and he just fired a shot in the air. Uh, he didn't aim at us, but that broke up the uh, Donnybrook. And, but anyway, the uh, sheriffs finally come out there with their dogs and their tear gas and all the whole riot patrol come out. And they didn't even bother to talk to their first, they just talked to the loggers. And this is where we're at in this day. The, the sheriff's department out there was totally on the side of the, uh, the logging operation. But anyway, Todd and Alicia come on up and sing us to, uh, into Judy Berry. Yeah. Why well, you know, they told me that they told me that there's no way you can offend houses. I can say anything I want today because there's no way that you can offend a Unitarian. <laughs> I'm not really sure that's true though. Utah Phillips told me that he made a bunch of Unitarians mad once and they burned a question mark on his lawn. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, Usually I, I talk a lot about the things that have happened up in the Timber Wars, some of the things that Hal was talking about and our struggles with the FBI, but what I wanted to talk about today is, is what our philosophical uh, and essentially our religious basis is of our actions. A lot, some of this is really alluded to by uh, Patrick who apparently shares some of these views. Um, but Earth First, what is Earth First? Earth First is not just a direct action, no compromise group, although it certainly is that. But Earth First stands for a philosophy, and the philosophy is summarized in those two words, Earth First. And this philosophy is known as deep ecology or biocentrism. 
And uh, what it says is that the earth is not just here for humans, it's the nature is not here, the purpose of nature is not for a smorgasbord for human consumption, but that um, all species have an equal right to exist for their own sake, not just for their usefulness to humans. And um, that humans need to take our proper place among the species. We need to live on the, learn to live on the earth in a way that isn't destroying the earth. And um, that, so that instead of like the biotechnology people who want to change nature to suit the wants of humans, rather than that, we need to change the way we live to suit the needs of nature. And these are certainly not new ideas. Um, these ideas are very consistent with the wisdom of the native people that the um, white industrial capitalist culture slaughtered when they came over here. Um, the earth does not belong to us, we belong to the earth that um, you know, humans did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in that web, and what we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Um, that, that's native wisdom. That, that didn't come from Earth first. But I think that this philosophy of biocentrism or deep ecology is really, truly, it's a profoundly revolutionary philosophy in the context of the society that we live in today. And I think that's one of the reasons why Earth First has had such an impact and encountered such repression above and beyond our numbers. Um, you know, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, all of those groups do good work, but one of the things that, but they do it in the context of saving nature for humans. Basically, that they're anthropocentric or human-centered view of the world, that we need to treat nature with more respect so that kind of we won't kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. But um, Earth First sees nature in, in an entirely different way, in this way of biocentrism or life-centered rather than human-centered. And that doesn't mean that we're anti-human, although some Earth Firsters may be. I, I happen to disagree with that myself. Um, because what we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. We are part of the web of life. And I think that this, this philosophy of biocentrism or deep ecology is ultimately in the interests of humans as well as in the interests of all the species of the Earth. But I think this is a revolutionary philosophy for one reason because it contradicts the uh, religious and political foundations of the destructive society that we live in. And uh, the first of these that I want to talk about is the most obvious one is um, Western religion. And I, I, I'm sure that there is a, I don't even know that these religions were intended to say this, but the way that they've been interpreted by this society is in a very destructive manner, in a manner that contradicts the Earth First philosophy and its very basicness. Um and you know, the, the basic of the Judeo-Christian philosophy of that the earth was put here, that, that humans will have dominion over the earth, that all of the creatures, that we are the supreme beings made in the image of the creator, who I guess was a white man. Um, but at any rate, um, so that view of the earth is one that really contradicts the biocentric view of the earth. And um, you know, we may not be so aware of this as we go about our daily struggles, but our opposition up in timber country is very aware of it. And there's a really strong kind of right-wing Christian uh, bent that goes along with that, with the opposition timber. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a, so Lynn White Jr. in a, in a, in a um, speech to the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. He says that this, this idea of dominion over nature means that God planned and fashioned all the natural world explicitly for man's benefit and rule. No item in the physical creation has any purpose save to serve man's purposes. And, and that's really the mindset that all of us, whether in the cities or in, in the timber regions, any place, that's the mindset of the opposition. And uh, they are very much aware of this. In 1988, um, the Timber Association of California was formed. And the man who was the first president of this was named Bill Dennison. And now he's a respectable industry spokesman. He's the person who negotiated with Gail Lucas of the Sierra Club to, um, to come up with the Sierra Accord in 1991. We called it the Sierra Surrender. But at any rate, it was supposed to be a compromise solution to the logging plans. Well, so who is this man, Bill Dennison, who's the head of the Timber Association of California. Well, when he first took office, he mailed out a letter to all of the timber companies and uh, everyone who was to be members of this new Timber Association of California, and he was very overt about what his ideology was. 
He included a long piece by H.L. Richardson, a right-wing senator, in which he talked about confrontation politics and how the anti-environmental groups have to be more aggressive in confronting us, the environmentalists. And um, he, says, right, he says, there are two diametrically opposing views over the nature of man which prevail in contemporary American politics, two fundamental concepts totally alien to one another. And he says that this is what the genesis of the political dispute is. And he says uh, that, he says this genesis is in Judeo-Christian beliefs. Western man perceives himself and others as singularly unique, individual, spiritual, worthy, and created in the image of the creator. 100 years ago, Americans had a worldview. We were willing, to, we were willing participants in exporting Christian Judaic ethics. We set up missionaries around the world to bring the gospel of Christ to the heathen. Those were the days we called people heathens, and those were the days we knew the difference between a heathen and a civilized man. And then he goes on to say that he is embroiled in combat with the heathen, which is us. Well, heathen means people of the heath, of the field, people of the woods, and I'm proud to be called a heathen. But um, at any rate, uh, he didn't mean it in a man manner that engendered pride, but basically what he was doing was characterizing the timber struggle as a religious war, as not just a political struggle, but as a religious war. Um, another example of this is Representative Bill Dannemeyer, another right-wing Republican, who spoke in Eureka in 1991. And what he said is, he said that the big threat to America is the environmentalists, who he claims that we're more powerful than the Democrats and the Republicans put together, oh, that it were so. But uh, anyway, he says, he, says, um, he says that we should understand that this environmental party has as its objective a mission to change the society, to worship the creation instead of the creator. You have to understand their theology. Uh, I say we have to understand theirs, and their theology I call the theology of logging. Uh, he says, if you go through life and you don't believe in the hereafter and all you see before you today are trees and birds, if anybody begins to consume these things, then you can get excited about that because it's your whole world. Um, and this is where the militancy comes into the environmental movement. Well, I, I don't really see that we don't see a hereafter. We see a hereafter for our children and our children's children. And I think that there's not going to be much for, our, for the hereafter if we don't stop the logging practices that go along with this theology but, and, and the destructive practices throughout the society. But I think the ultimate statement of the theology of, the, of logging came from the Lord's Avenger. And the Lord's Avenger is somebody who took credit for bombing me and claimed his reasons and having to do with his um, right-wing Christian ideology. And what he says is this. This is me he's talking about. This woman, possessed of the devil, set herself on the honest men of the toil who do God's work to bring, bring forth the bounty that he has given us to take. All the forests that grow and all the wild creatures within them are a gift to man that he shall use freely with God's blessing to build the kingdom of God on earth. They shall be never ending because God will provide. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and the cattle and every, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, which of course is the Genesis quote upon which this ideology is based. All of it is God's gift for us to take and use so that we can build our civilization in the image of the Creator. The devil is sorely displeased by our godly dominion, and he sends his demons to sow confusion and doubt in our numbers. This possessed demon, Judy Berry, spread her poison to tell the multitude that trees were not God's gift to man, but the trees were themselves God's, and that it was a sin to cut them. My spirit ached as her paganism festered before mine eyes. I felt the power of the Lord stir within my heart, and I knew that I had been chosen to strike down this demon. So um, that's the mentality that we're fighting in against, and I really think it's important to us for us to understand what we're up against. I'm going to give you one final example, and this is one of the death threats, and this is a, kind of one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> John 3.16, you are filthy sinners, whores, lesbians, homosexuals, Jews, abortionists, pornographers, Earth First members, Planned Parenthood members, <laughs> now members, non-Christians will burn forever in the fires of hell. God is man, man is God. God made woman to have babies. God made woman for man. God made woman to serve man. Woman must obey man. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. <laughs> Turn or burn. 
God made the earth for man. God made fish, animals, and trees for man's youth. use. Jesus is man. The Pope is man. God made woman unclean. <laughs> so, um, you know, th this is when, when Hal tells you the stories of people punching us and stuff like that. We need to understand where they're coming from and how, I think, twisted people's minds really are in this society. Because to justify something like the obvious destruction of the earth, all you got to do is look around you. In our area, we can see the miles of clear cuts. Here, you can just look at the sky and the oil tanks and everything else. And it's really anybody who isn't consciously denying it will recognize that this society is destroying the earth. And, and it takes a twisted ideology to justify it. I certainly think that's what we're doing. So Earth First is the only one of these groups that I know of to very consciously um, to express the, the philosophy of biocentrism or deep ecology. And I think that's one of the reasons, in addition to our methods of direct action, that makes us such a target. Um, that last death threat that I read also um, had a lot to say about women. And again, like the song that Todd and Alicia sang, there's a very close link between the hatred of women and the destruction of the earth. And that's the second way that I think that the philosophy of deep ecology contradicts the dominant power paradigm. And uh, I think that deep ecology corresponds perfectly with ecofeminism, which is a holistic way of looking at the earth as interrelated rather than this kind of separating, we'll just look at humans, we'll just look at how many stems are growing after the clear cut, because that's, the, that's their measure of the health of a forest. There's more stems growing now than there used to be. Well, there used to be trees, not just stems. Anyway. Um, so, um, but by ecofeminism, a lot of people don't really know what that term means, and I think it's so hooked up with this Christian anti-life, anti-earth ideology that we need to go into it a little bit. Um, by ecofeminism, there's two things that I mean by it. The first is that there is an, an analogy, there's a parallel between the way women are treated in this society and the way that the earth is treated in this society. And if you doubt that, considering the, consider the two phrases, virgin redwoods and working forests, <laughs> okay? So, um, but I think that um, there's more to it than that. The second aspect of ecofeminism that to me is the more important is that, um, it's not just that there's an analogy, but the, that there's a connection. That the suppression of the feminine in the society is part of the cause of the destruction of the earth. And when I say the feminine and the masculine, I'm putting them in quotes because I actually believe that both genders possess both qualities. Um, but I think, I certainly know this as a macho woman, okay? But, um, but the fact that, but in this society, those qualities, the masculine and the feminine, are separated at birth by the culture that we grow up in. And what we do in this, or not we, but what is done to us in this society, is that those masculine qualities of conquering and dominance, um, those are valued by the society, whether exhibited by a man or a woman. And those, those values of nurturing and, and life-giving and cooperation, those are devalued by this society. So I think that it's the suppression of feminine values with it, as well as the suppression of women within the society that contributes to the destruction of the earth. Um, the hatred of the feminine is the hatred of life. So um, I, I think that one of the reasons that I've been targeted is not just because I, what, of what I've been saying, but also the fact that a woman is saying it. I think that that threatens the patriarchy. And I think that the concept of biocentrism of deep ecology contradicts the patriarchy. Um, all of those quotes that I just read you from all of those right-wing players in the timber industry, all of them also referred, in, and this is all three of them, in the same document, elsewhere referred to the abortion issue. That the abortion issue is somehow very closely linked. The, the, right, the, the, you know, the, the right of them to force women to bear children seems to be linked to the right to slaughter the forest somehow in the minds of the right wing that we're fighting against. And um, again, I, I want to, just to show you the link between these two issues, I want to read from the Lord's Avenger, which kind of crystallizes the whole thing. He says, I built with these hands the bomb that I placed in the car of Judy Berry. This woman is possessed of the devil. No natural woman created of our Lord spews forth the lies, calumnies, and poisons that she does with such evil power. The Lord cleared my vision and revealed this unto me outside the baby killing clinic. When Judy Berry smote, smote with Satan's words, the humble and faithful servants of the Lord who had come there to make witness against abortion, referring to in a clinic defense I was in. 
I saw Satan's flames shoot forth from her mouth, her eyes, and ears, proving forever that this was no godly woman, no Ruth full of obedience to procreate and multiply the children of Adam throughout the world as is God's divine will. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So um, I think that these two issues are so twisted up that they're very hard to separate them. And you know, the idea in order to have a just society, a society that respected life, that respected all life, I think in addition to um, the many other things, we, we need to see a rise of the feminine, the so feminine in the society, a value. I don't just mean electing more Diane, Diane Feinsteins to office. Um, what I mean, because a woman who will cooperate with the male power structure, Margaret Thatcher, you know, you know, that's not, it, that's not feminine values. That's putting a woman in a position in a man's world where she's willing to play along with the game. But we live in a society that, I'm not saying that all men are the oppressors, but most of the oppressors are men. And uh, um, we live in a society where increasingly women are not only devalued, feminist values are not uh, respected, but also there's been increasingly just open violence and harassment against women and, 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 and those who would support them, such as uh, Dr. Gunn, who was shot for performing abortions. So th these two issues are so linked, they're really hard to separate them. Um, but really, what, what the issue is, is the hatred of life. And I think that that's what we're really fighting against, is a very perverted ideology. So um, for those reasons, I think we really have to look at the, the, the basis of what we're going against, the philosophical basis, and not just look at what we do, but why we do it. Um, rather than just deep ecology or biocent biocentrism, though, recently we've been calling this revolutionary ecology because it also has political implications. Um, pol deep ecology, con biocentrism, contradicts the idea of capitalism. If all species have an equal right to, to exist, then how can Charles Hurwitz, the head of Maxam, claim to own a 2,000-year-old redwood and by that ownership have the right to cut it down? The concept of private property, of owning the earth, uh, certainly contradicts the idea of deep ecology. It certainly contradicts native wisdom. Um, and that's the basis of capitalism. I also think that capitalism exists by extracting profits, not just from the workers, but from the earth, by taking from the earth more than it gives, than, than it gives back. So I think that the implications of deep ecology, would have, capitalism would have to go. And that's one of the reasons I think we're such a threat. But even farther than that, I think that why I say it's a profoundly revolutionary philosophy, I also think it contradicts communism or socialism as it's been presented in this world so far. Because communism, socialism, and all the left ideologies that I've ever studied or, or learned about, and I've certainly studied them all, um, they speak only to the redistribution of the spoils of raping the earth, of a more equitable distribution of that within among different classes of humans. But it doesn't address the relationship of the human society to the earth. And I think that that's the primary contradiction. Marx says the primary contradiction is between labor and capital, between the workers and the bosses. But I think the primary contradiction, as we're seeing by the collapse of the earth's ecosystem, is between the society and the earth itself. So for those reasons, I think that we've been targeted, and I think we need to understand what we're, what we're fighting against. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should give up. I, I don't think we have that option. I think we just need to proceed with an awareness of what we're fighting and, and so that we can educate ourselves to what we're doing. It, we, we can't back down to this kind of, of perverted ideology because if we do, our children are going to inherit a wasteland. That's what the hereafter really is for me. Um, and deep ecology does not just represent an ideology. It represents a truth. It doesn't matter whether or not humans think the earth is here for our consumption, whether or not humans think that they're the supreme beings on earth. The fact is that nature is an interrelated system and that humans are merely a part of that system and not the, the recipients of, all, of the system. And um, it doesn't matter whether we recognize it or not, it still exists. And our failure to recognize it is what's causing the collapse of the life support systems of the earth. So we need to keep we need to keep on with our struggles and we need to face up to whatever they throw at us. We need to remember what we're fighting against and educate us, ourselves about it. Spread the, the, the overt philosophy of deep ecology, biocentrism, revolutionary philosophy, Earth first.
Todd, Alicia, and Max. Is she still here? Yeah. Okay, great. Everybody's going to come up here for a minute. And, um, what we're going to do is, uh, at the beginning of this ceremony, Hal lit a candle for Cesar Chavez, which is still burning. And um, uh, I want to do a little, um, just a little thing for Cesar. He's been a great influence on me. Um, the idea of nonviolent resistance, the idea of stopping this power, this power structure by non-cooperation. To me, that's where it's really at. And what, wait a minute, I'm going to do the Viva Zabajas first, so hold on. Um, so what I'm going to do first is, I, I just, what I want to do to, just to share some of who Cesar was and how he, uh, you know, how the spirit was spread in the farm workers. Uh, first is, uh, I have a song, De Colores, which I'm not sure a lot of you have heard of, that we're going to play. And this was a song that, or is a song that the farm workers sing a lot on the, um, on the picket lines. And so what I want to do is pass it around, how many of these do you all need? <laughs> We've got one there. Okay. Oh, and so here maybe you, you all can. And so, but while we're passing these around, I'm going to do something else that they did. And what they do in the uh, Farm Workers Union and actually in many of the um, Hispanic se struggles is uh, vivas and abajo. And viva means long live, of course, and abajo means down with. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say viva something and you'll respond viva, or if it's something bad, you'll respond abajo, okay? So while we're passing out, we'll do this. Viva Cesar Chavez! Viva! viva! Abajo, the growers who get rich off the blood of the campesinos. Abajo! Viva the United Farm Workers, the source of pride and, and respect to the farm workers of the migrant workers in the United States. Viva! viva! Abajo, the toxic death, the chemicals of death that they pour on the farm workers in the grape fields. Fuzzed and methyl bromide, Dinah said, Captain. Abajo! Viva Dolores Huerta! Viva! Viva! Abajo, the San Francisco police who beat her for speaking out for the rights of the farm workers. Abajo! Viva la lucha, the struggle of the people. Viva! Viva! Abajo, toxic racism, Chevron, pouring racism, cancer, death on the people of Richmond. Abajo! Viva the grassroots activism of the people of Richmond who are rising up to fight those corporations. Viva! Abajo, Louisiana Pacific, Georgia Pacific, Maxam, the raping timber companies who are destroying the earth for private profit. Abajo! Viva Earth First! Viva! Viva, Viva Cesar Chavez! Viva! Viva the nonviolent resistance! Viva! Viva Cesar Chavez! Viva! Viva Cesar Chavez! Viva! Okay. <laughs> and then, um, before we start the song, the tune is really simple, and we'll sing it a couple times so you can sing along with it. And this is a Mexican folk song, and what it says, I'll, I'll translate it for those who don't know it, is um, that uh, made, de colores, made of colors, that the, the hills in the springtime are made of colors, the birds, los pajaritos, the, the birds that come, those are also made of colors. Um, arco, arco iris, the arc, arch of iris, the rainbow, made of colors. The, uh, the arco iris, the rainbow is made of colors that comes to shine. And for these reasons, my greatest loves, those grandes amores, are made of many colors and they might me gustan a me, they please me very much. The second uh, verse is kind of a barnyard verse. And uh, it, it starts out with uh, Cant el gallo, and the gallo is the rooster. Um, there's a little typo in here. It's supposed to, they're all supposed to be cues. Kitty, 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 kitty. And uh, Spanish speaking roosters go kitty, kitty, kitty. And uh, English speaking roosters say cock a doodle doo. <laughs> at any rate, so, uh, and then the next one, la gallina, that's the hen. Um, the gallina with her cara, cara, cara. And los polluelos, those are the little chicks, pio, pio, pio. And so um, that, that should give you an idea, and everything is made of colors. And, and also, the other thing about the farm workers' use of this song is that our movement is made of many colors also. That it's made of many colors of people, and many colors of thought, and that, they, that we are diverse, that like the flowers, that we um, are made of many colors. Okay, you ready? Yes. Okay, ready? Go ahead. Say beast in los campos in la primavera. De colores, de 
colores son los pajaritos que vienen de afuera. Y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí. So women, you can sing this. <laughs> Cante el gallo, cante el gallo con el kitty, 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 kitty. La gallina, la gallina con el cara, cara. Closer to the mic packs. And so los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan. Okay, back to the beginning. Now that y'all know it. De colores, de colores se visten los campos en la primavera.